understand this passage. Ways uh, where you could connect with things in real life, things that you encounter on a daily basis that may help illustrate what James is trying to say. Well, once I got started, I, I had to just stop because it was going to be way more than I would ever be able to share. So think about just some of these things, okay? Think about what it's like to have a balloon without air. Now visualize that. A balloon without air. How about this? A car without gas. How many of you have ever experienced that before? How about a refrigerator without food? That's a sad sight. Listen, I'm a bachelor. I understand that. You wake up in the middle of the night and go look for something to eat. And open the refrigerator door, you see, okay, pickles, baking soda, ketchup. I think it's time to go to the grocery store. A refrigerator without food. A gun without bullets. Hunters, has that ever happened to you before? It's happened to me at a terrible, terrible time while deer hunting. You, you, not only is it important to have bullets, here's the thing, it's important to have the, the right caliber of bullets for the gun that you've got. How about an aquarium without water? That's not much use, is it? An iPhone, this is for our young people, an iPhone without any apps. There's an app for that. A book without words. Some of you say, that's the kind of books I like, one with just pictures. A church without people. Well, that's not a church, is it? It's just a building. It's just a shell. A piano without a pianist. A mug without coffee. A school without students. I can go on and on and on here. But do you see the point I'm trying to make? There's something that is missing in the case of every one of these things I've mentioned, and that thing that is missing is substantial. That thing that is missing keeps whatever I've described from being what it is supposed to be. And the Apostle James says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Faith Without works is just as sad, just as empty, it's just as lifeless, it is just as purposeless as the church without people, or the refrigerator without food, or the balloon without air. The Apostle James wanted the people who were reading this to realize that there's something more than just believing. There's something more than just checking off the boxes on a test that say, yes, I believe that. Trinity, I believe that. Jesus resurrected, I believe that. Uh, the Bible is inspired, I believe that. That the Christian life, that the walk of faith, but the life of the blood-bought, born-again, spirit-filled saints of the living God is more than just checking off boxes as to what we believe. As the body without the spirit is dead. Now what is he talking about there? Uh, in James's terminology that he's using, the spirit is life. The, the spirit, once your spirit departs from your body, what is your body? It's dead. We call it a corpse once the spirit has departed. Now, what can that corpse do? Nothing. Uh, what kind of ambitions does that corpse have? None. Uh, what is that corpse planning to do tomorrow? Doesn't have a plan. What control does that corpse have over its situation? <clears throat> Nothing. Because the spirit has departed from the corpse. It is no longer animated. It is no longer alive. It is no longer powerful. It is no longer thinking. It is no longer doing. It is no longer fulfilling its purpose for which it was designed. Because the life has gone out of it. James says that faith without works, that faith without good deeds is just as useless as a corpse. It does nothing, has no ambition, is not striving forward, does not seek to change its surroundings. Nothing about it is good. It's just dead. The spirit is gone from it and a life of faith 
that does not do good works, that does not do good deeds, is just, listen to me, as dead as the corpse. You say, well, preacher, I didn't think that you had to do good works to be saved. How are we saved? Uh, well, let's tell you what let's do. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, if, that screen, if we can bring up that verse on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, we'll talk about how we're saved. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that we're saved. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2. It's not by our works that we're saved. I'm not saying that your works, your good deeds, the things that you've done for God are going to save you. I've said this again and again and again, but I get the feeling that it hasn't gotten through. So I'm going to say it again. Are you listening? Everybody with me? There is not a set of scales in heaven. I'm telling you, there are so many people. There are so many people, and probably people sitting in this congregation this morning, that their hope and assurance of going to heaven is based on the fact that they believe they've done more good things than they've done bad things. And when they get to heaven, St. Peter is going to take all their good things and put on one side of a scale, and he's going to take all their bad things and sit on the other side of the scale, and because they've done more good things than bad things, it's going to tip over this way, and they're going to get to go to heaven. That old guy that they know that lives down the road, when he gets there, the... the the bad side's going to tip over and the trap door's going to open up. He's going to fall down into hell. It's going to be a singed smell come up, right? Folks, that's Hollywood. That's the Cartoon Network. Uh, that's make-believe. That's paganism. That's not the Bible. There is not a set of scales in heaven. Anybody who has ever been saved has been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You say, what about those people in the Old Testament? They were saved by grace through faith. They believed God and it was credited to them as righteousness based on what He had shown them to believe. No set of scales in heaven. So our works are not what save us. This means no and this means yes. Just so you know our signal system here. Our works do not save us. You say, well, preacher, I'm just scanning up here and reading some of these other verses that, uh, where we were, and, and uh, I'm sort of confused about that. Well, let's look at uh, James chapter 2. Look at verse 14. That's going to come up on the screen. Uh, in verse 14, the apostle James says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? I can agree with that statement. Can such faith save him? I'm going to read that again because it's so important. Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It's dead. You say, well, preacher, when I read that, that sort of tells me that it's my good deeds, it's my works that save me. Now, let me clear up this misconception. Right, now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, said in Ephesians chapter 2, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, so that no man could boast, right? That's what we just read. And then it seems like James on the other hand, is saying that uh, if the, the faith does not have works, then it's not going to save you. It takes works to be able to save you. Is that what he's saying? This illustration may help you understand this. Paul and James were looking at the same thing from different angles. Paul and James were both looking at salvation. They were both looking at being born again. But when Paul looked at it, Paul looked at salvation and he saw the root of the tree of salvation. The root of the tree of salvation. And Paul said, if the root of that tree is alive, then that tree will produce fruit. Fruit is good works, the root is faith. So if the root is alive, the tree will one day produce the fruit that it's supposed to. Good fruit will be there one day because the root is alive. 
On the other hand, James looked at the tree and saw the fruit. And James saw the fruit, that's the good works, and he said, because that tree has fruit, good works, I know that the root, faith, is alive. Because it would not produce fruit if the root was not alive. Paul said, because the root is alive, the tree will produce fruit. Have I confused you or cleared it up? Half and half? They're looking at the same thing, folks. Paul and James are not disagreeing with each other. But here's what both of them are saying. Both Paul and James are saying, if you have authentic faith, if you have a faith that saves, if you have a faith that will take you to heaven one day, that faith, that root of faith will produce fruit in the life of the believer. It's not a might. It's not a could be. It's not a chance. It will. Saving faith Works A faith that does not motivate you to do good works is dead. That's just what he said here. That faith without works is dead. And dead faith cannot save. I'm going to say that again. Faith without works is dead. A dead faith. And faith that is dead cannot save. How are you going to get eternal life from a dead faith? I'm looking around here this morning and the light bulb's coming on for for some folks. You're beginning to realize something. Do you realize that we are saved to serve? The reason that after you accepted Christ, the reason that after, after your faith, became real. That God didn't just go ahead and take you on up to heaven. The mo- Have you ever thought about why He doesn't do that? The moment we're saved, the moment we're born again, when we accept Christ and our faith is real, why doesn't He just reach on down, take us on up to heaven, and get us out of this place so we don't have to put up with all the terrible things that heaven's so good and this world's so bad after we're saved? How about, why don't He just reach down and take us up to heaven as soon as we're saved? Because we're saved to serve. And listen to me, every blood-bought, born-again, spirit-filled saint of the living God has something to do in the kingdom. Everybody does. The Bible describes in several different places something called spiritual gifts. For Christians, for people who have been saved, God supernaturally implants within you the ability to do what He's calling you to do. Has God ever called you, asked you, tugged at your heart to do something that that you didn't feel like you could do, you weren't confident that you could do? Maybe so. But I promise you this, folks, God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. And when God calls you to do something, I believe this upon the authority of the Word of God and it's proven in my own personal experience when God calls you to do something. Listen to me. Somebody's not getting this that needs to. When God calls you to do something, when God asks you to do something, don't make excuses and don't delay and don't procrastinate and put it off because God is going to empower you to do it. You just be obedient. You step out in faith and you do what He's asking you to do and not have an old dead faith. Have a living faith that will step out and work for the Lord. Amen? We're saved to serve. Every one of us has spiritual gifts. Folks, there are... There are a lot of things that this church should be doing that we're not. Now, we do a lot of things. I'm going to be honest. We probably do a lot more than a lot of other churches. I know that we do. I know that we do a lot more than a majority of churches. There's a lot that we don't do that we should do. And folks, do you know what? God has within this church the people, the resources, the ability and the time for us to accomplish everything that He wants us to do. Everything that God wants us to do as a church, He's implanted the people here to do it. Now, is everybody doing what they're supposed to be doing? Obviously not. Oh, y'all didn't know it was going to be one of them kind of sermons, huh? (laughs) You're saved to serve. 
God's got something for you to do. It's more than just checking off your box and saying, I went to church that day and I'm checking off the box. I believe in Jesus and checking off the box. I believe the Bible, checking off the box. I believe in heaven. No, God's got something for you to do. And the Bible says it. And if you believe the Bible, you've got to believe this, that a faith that will get you to heaven is a faith that will put you to work for the Lord. And I'm telling you this from personal experience, that if you have not found your purpose in the kingdom of God, if you have not found out what God has for you to do, your life is missing something. If you have not discovered what God has given you the talent and ability to do, and you're not doing that, you're missing out on a joy because a life without heavenly purpose is not a life that is enjoyable and worth living. God's purpose for your life will give meaning to your life. God's plan for your life will bring joy to your life. What God has for you to do is what you were designed to do. Have you ever heard about the chicken and the eagle? There there was uh, an eagle egg one time that, that fell out of the nest and it Rolled down the hill and rolled down the hill and rolled down the hill and, and finally rolled to, to right outside the, the, chi- the chicken coop. And the farmer came along and said, well, you know, old Bessie must have laid an egg out here for some reason. Took it and put it in, in her clutch of eggs there and, and hatched out. And, and lo and behold, it, it wasn't a chicken that, that that hen hatched out of that egg. There were three little baby chicks, three little bitties, and an eagle. And that eagle was raised by the chicken, raised by the hen, and and it scratched around and pecked at the ground and scratched around and pecked at the ground. And just like the little bitties, they all grew up and became little pullets and and, uh, later on became chicken and dumplings. No, I didn't say that. You know they do, though. (laughs) But there's this eagle scratching around on the ground, picking and clawing, until one day it it, uh, gets set free out of the chicken coop, maybe scratch around in the yard, find some, uh, some worms and some crickets and stuff. And, and that eagle looked up and it saw this beautiful, majestic creature in the sky. And, and in its heart, it knew that something was missing in its life. And in its heart, it knew there was something about that beautiful, majestic creature flying in the sky. And it began to work in that little eagle that thought it was a chicken and and he began flapping his wings and all of a sudden he got airborne and he flew higher and flew higher and he's soaring across the sky and all of a sudden he realizes, hey, this is what I was made for. This is what I was designed to do. This is what I've been missing all along. And here's my point. Too many Christians are scratching around on the ground and they're being held down when they need to spread their wings and fly and discover their purpose in God. And that's in serving the Lord the way He intended from the beginning. Don't be a chicken when you can be an eagle. God has a plan for your life. And it's not to have a dead faith, it's to have a working faith. Faith without deeds is dead. Folks, let me ask you some some questions to ponder. Does your faith serve? And now this is personal evaluation time, okay? What have you done for the Lord? What have you done for God? What have you done for Jesus? How are you serving the Lord? You say, I'm too old. No, you're not. There's something for you to do. You say, I'm too young. No, you're not. There's something for you to do. No one's too old. No one's too young. You say, I I am just totally ill-equipped. You say, I can't do anything. You say, preacher, I don't have any ability. I don't have any talents. You sound like Moses saying to the Lord, Lord, I can't speak. And God said, who made your tongue? You just do what God's asking you to do and you let Him be concerned with the talent and ability. He'll get it done. You know what He asks from you? Faithfulness. Do you know what He asks from you? Obedience. Do you know what the Lord asks from you? 
He asks from you to say yes. Yes, Lord, to your will and to your way. Yes, Lord, wherever you're leading me. Yes, Lord, whatever the question is to me. Lord, it may be hard, it may be difficult, I may not be equipped, but Lord, you can do it all. For with God all things are possible. So my answer to you is yes, Lord, to whatever it is. If you've never done anything for the Lord, and you're not serving the Lord in, in any real way, and you really don't feel a desire to, folks, you've got to ask yourself, are you truly born again? Are you truly saved? I, I don't understand a lot, a lot of things. I don't understand. But I don't understand how somebody can say, I, I was lost in sin and, and I was bound for a devil's hell and I could not do anything to save myself. And God in His rich mercy sent Jesus to save me and He saved me, washed away my sins, cleansed me of all my unrighteousness and has me a home prepared in heaven for all time and eternity. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So that's great, friend. So what are you doing to thank the Lord? Oh, nothing. You mean He did all that for you. It didn't cost you a penny. You could not do it for yourself. You could not save yourself. But you're not doing anything for God to thank Him. Oh, no, I, I, I don't guess I really need to. I just don't understand that. I just really believe that people who have... Listen to me. People who have experienced the love of God. People who have understood that we do so much that's unlovable and yet He still loves me. That I've, I have let Him down so many times. I have failed Him again and again and yet He still has mercy on me. And so many times He should have just shot a lightning bolt out and struck me dead for what I had done. And yet He didn't and His grace overflows again and again. But no, I'm, I'm not really doing anything for Him. I'm not really... You know, even that faithful at church, I'm, I'm, you know, I just really hadn't seen the need for that. But all that other stuff that I said is true. It doesn't make sense, does it? Because faith without works, without deeds, is dead. And folks, if you have a faith that doesn't work, I'm not saying this, the Bible says it, then your faith is dead. And a dead faith can't give eternal life. Do you need to be saved, genuinely born again? Are you really saved? Do you know that Jesus is your Savior and that heaven will be your home? Do you know that? I, listen, I'm not talking about having religion. I'm not talking about your name being on the roll at the church. I'm not talking about who your mama and daddy and grandparents were. I'm talking about you and your personal commitment that you've made to Jesus Christ, have you been born again? Folks, it, folks, it's an experience. It's something real. If you've been born again and it was real, say amen. It's a real thing. It's real. If you've experienced it, you know it. I pray today that somebody will realize that, that what they've got is, is not real and it's dead. It's a dead faith and they need the real thing today. And I pray that in this invitation that's upcoming, that you'll step out and walk this aisle and you'll find it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that people have heard your word and they'll respond to it in faith. Not dead faith, but living, living faith. Lord, I pray. I pray that the one who's closest to hell this morning, I know that's a, a strong thing to pray, but Lord, none of us know the day or the hour. None of us know our time here on earth. So Lord, I pray the one that's closest to going out into eternity without you will be saved today. Tug at their heart tug at their heart. Lord, I pray that there will not be a man, woman, boy, or girl leave here today without knowing that Jesus is their Savior 
and that heaven will be their home. Lord, and I pray that people who are saved, they've really been born again. Their faith is real, but they know they haven't been serving, and they know that God's got something for them to do, and they haven't been doing it. I pray that today that they'll drive a stake in the ground and say, I'm going to find my place of service in this church, and I'm going to find my way to serve Jesus in this world. I, I pray, Lord, that that faith will be revived. It'll be real. And it'll bring purpose and meaning and joy to their lives. I pray these things in Jesus' name, not for the glory of any man, but for the glory of God and God alone. And all God's people say, Amen. Would you stand? Now's your time to come. As we sing, don't wait, don't delay. Softly and tenderly, you come. <laughs>